the aftermath of the murder of Elizabeth Stride, several people came forward to claim that they had seen her in the company of a man or different men in the hour leading up to her death on the 30th of September, 1888. One of the most important of these witnesses, but also one of the most enigmatic, was a Hungarian Jew by the name of Israel Schwartz. Schwartz walked into Lehman Street Police Station on the evening of Sunday the 30th of September to provide what the Star newspaper described as information that may be important. According to the Star, Schwartz was well-dressed and had the appearance of being in the theatrical line. He could not speak a word of English and was therefore accompanied to the police station by a friend who acted as his interpreter. Up to the 29th of September, he and his wife had resided in Berners Street, but on that day they were due to move to new lodgings in nearby Ellen Street and Schwartz had gone out for the day, leaving his wife to oversee their move. Around 12.45am on the 30th of September, he was walking home along Commercial Road and he decided to cut along Berners Street to see if his wife had completed the move. As he made his way along Berners Street, he noticed a man walking ahead of him. According to a report on the murder of Elizabeth Stride, compiled by Chief Inspector Donald Swanson and dated the 19th of October, Schwartz saw the man stop and speak to a woman who was standing in the gateway of Dutfield Yard. The man tried to pull the woman into the street, but she resisted, whereupon he turned her round and threw her down onto the footway, at which point the woman screamed three times, but not very loudly. Schwartz described the man as aged about 30, 5 foot 5 inches tall, with broad shoulders and a full face. He had a fair complexion, dark hair and a small brown moustache. He was wearing a dark jacket and trousers with a black cap with a peak. Schwartz believed that he was witnessing a domestic argument and, not wishing to get dragged into it, he crossed over to the opposite side of Berner Street. As he did so, he noticed a man standing on the other side of the street who was lighting a clay pipe. This second man was aged 35, was around 5 foot 11 with a fresh complexion, light brown hair and a brown moustache. He was wearing a dark overcoat and an old black felt hat with a wide brim. At this moment, the man who was attacking the woman shouted to the man with the pipe, Lipsky! And the second man began to follow Schwartz, who, feeling that he might be in danger, broke into a run. But by the time he reached the railway arch further down the street, the man had ceased following him, and Schwartz duly relaxed his pace. On being quizzed by the police, Schwartz stated that he could not say whether the two men were together or even known to each other. The shout of Lipsky was a reference to a notorious murder that had taken place the previous year in Batty Street, the adjacent thoroughfare to the east of Berner Street. Israel Lipsky, a Jew who was lodging in an upper room at number 16, had been accused of poisoning a fellow lodger, a Jewess by the name of Miriam Angel, by pouring nitric acid down her throat. Lipsky had been found guilty of the crime and, despite a press campaign to clear his name, he had been hanged. The newspaper reports of the murder had fueled a great deal of anti-Semitism in the East End of London, and by 1888 the term Lipsky was frequently used as a derogatory insult by Gentiles to Jews in the neighbourhood. Inspector Aberline, in a report dated the 1st of November 1888, opined that, As Schwartz has a strong Jewish appearance, I am of the opinion it was addressed to him as he stopped to look at the man he saw ill-using the deceased woman. Israel Schwartz was taken to the mortuary in nearby St. George's churchyard where he was shown the body of Elizabeth Stride, whom he identified as the woman he had seen being attacked in Berners Street. Since Louis Diemschutz would find her body in Dutfield Yard at 1am, it is highly probable that Schwartz actually saw the early stages of Elizabeth Stride's murder, as it seems unlikely that two assaults by two different men would have taken place on the same woman in the same gateway in the space of just 15 minutes. It is therefore probable that Israel Schwartz saw the face of Elizabeth Stride's killer and, if as is generally believed, Elizabeth Stride was a victim of Jack the Ripper, then Schwartz saw the face of Jack the Ripper. However, the presence of the second man adds a further element of mystery to the case. Was he an accomplice of the murderer? 
Or was he, like Schwartz, simply a witness to the attack? Aberline, in his report of the 1st of November, raised the possibility that the man may have been an alarmed bystander as opposed to an accessory to the crime. According to Aberline, Schwartz stated that the man who was lighting his pipe also ran in the same direction as himself, but whether this man was running after him or not, he could not tell. He might have been alarmed the same as himself and ran away. Surprisingly, the newspapers, on the whole, paid scant attention to Israel Schwartz's story. Indeed, the only newspaper to report in any detail on what he saw was The Star, a reporter from which appears to have been at Lehman Street Police Station on the Sunday evening when Schwartz first came in to divulge what he had seen. The reporter then tracked Schwartz to his new address in Ellen Street and was able to secure an interview with him, albeit since, as the subsequent article admitted, the reporter's Hungarian was quite as imperfect as the foreigner's English. The interview was conducted via an interpreter who happened to be at hand. The account that Schwartz gave to the reporter appeared in the Star newspaper on the 1st of October, and it differed in several important respects to the statement he had given to the police. According to the article, when Schwartz turned into Berners Street, he noticed the man some distance in front of him, walking as if partially intoxicated. The half-tipsy man, he told the reporter, stopped and talked to a woman who was standing in the alley where the body was afterwards found. The man put his hand on the woman's shoulder and pushed her back into the passage, as opposed to pulling her into the street, which is what he told the police had happened. Believing that he was witnessing a quarrel, he crossed to the other side of the street to avoid getting mixed up in it, but just as he stepped off the curb, a second man came out of the doorway of the public house a few doors off. In this version, Schwartz stated that the second man shouted out some sort of warning to the man who was with the woman, and then he rushed forward to attack Schwartz. Significantly, in the Star version, Schwartz claimed that he saw a knife in the second man's hand, but he waited to see no more and fled the scene to his new lodgings. In this version of his story, the second man was undoubtedly a confederate of the murderer, and the fact that he was holding a knife rather than lighting a pipe adds another twist to the saga. The discrepancies could be accounted for by the fact that Schwartz made the two statements through different interpreters and thus one of the statements could have been a case of misinterpretation. There is also the possibility that Schwartz may have been offered some financial inducement by the reporter and he may have spiced up his account to the journalist. He did, after all, according to the article, have the appearance of being in the theatrical line. The final possibility is that the reporter himself may have misunderstood what the interpreter was saying, or even, perish the thought, decided to embellish the story by replacing the pipe in the man's hand with a knife. The Star's article ended with the intriguing statement that the police have arrested one man, answering the description the Hungarian furnishes. This prisoner has not been charged, but is held for inquiries to be made. Elsewhere in its coverage of the murder, the Star stated that the police have been told that a man aged between 35 and 40 years of age and of fair complexion was seen to throw the woman murdered in Berners Street to the ground. Those who saw it thought that it was a man and his wife quarrelling and no notice was taken of it. This is without doubt a reference to the attack that Schwartz claimed to have seen and since it mentions those who witnessed the assault, plural, it would suggest that the second man was a bystander as opposed to a collaborator. Interestingly, in the margin of the report compiled by Chief Inspector Swanson on the 19th of October, it is stated that the police apparently do not suspect the second man whom Schwartz saw on the other side of the street and who followed Schwartz. However, on the 2nd of October, the Star reported that the police were starting to doubt Schwartz's story. In the matter of the Hungarian who said he saw a struggle between a man and a woman in the passage where the stride body was afterwards found, the Lehman Street police have reason to doubt the truth of the story. They arrested one man on the description thus obtained and a second on that furnished from another source, but they are not likely to act further on the same information without additional facts. That begs the question of who was the other source? Was it the second man who Schwartz saw lighting his pipe?
Given the sensational nature of Israel Schwartz's account, it is quite remarkable that other newspapers didn't make more of his story. The Scotsman, in its edition of Tuesday the 2nd of October, published the following brief report, which is evidently referring to Schwartz's experience. Another story was to the effect that a man of light complexion had been seen struggling with the woman's stride in Burner Street, and that he threw her down. But it being thought it was a man and wife quarrelling, nobody interfered with them. Since this snippet appeared verbatim in several other newspapers across the country, it evidently originated from a news agency. But that is about the only mention made in the press other than the detailed account given in the Star's report. What is even more surprising is that, given that Schwartz appears to have witnessed the early stages of Elizabeth Stride's murder, he wasn't called to give evidence at the inquest into her death before coroner Win Edwin Baxter, or at least, if he was, his name doesn't appear in any of the newspaper accounts of the inquest proceedings. The fact that he wasn't called as a witness could suggest that the police had, as the star suggested, come to doubt the veracity of his account. And yet, it is plain from the surviving official reports that the police most certainly did not discount him as a witness. He is, for example, mentioned by Swanson in his report of the 19th of October. Swanson even goes so far as to favour Schwartz's statement over that of one of his own officers, Police Constable William Smith, who saw Elizabeth stride with a man in Berners Street at 12.35am on the 30th of September, but whose description of the man he saw was so completely at odds to the description given by Schwartz of the man he had seen that they were obviously describing different people. Swanson wrote that, if Schwartz is to be believed, and the police report of his statement casts no doubt upon it, it follows if they are describing different men that the man Schwartz saw and described is the more probable of the two to be the murderer. So I respectfully submit it is not clearly proved that the man that Schwartz saw is the murderer, although it is clearly the more probable of the two. Inspector Aberline, on the 1st of November, a full month after the murder, stated in his report that he had questioned Israel Schwartz very closely at the time he made the statement, and at no point does Aberline cast doubt on the veracity of Schwartz's story. So why wasn't such an important witness called to appear at the inquest into Elizabeth Stride's death? Or did he actually testify, and his appearance was not reported in the media, because his evidence was given behind closed doors in camera. Interestingly, in the official files, Abilene's report is followed by a draft letter that was written by Assistant Commissioner and Head of the Criminal Investigation Department, Dr Robert Anderson. It reads, I have to state that the opinion arrived at in this department upon the evidence of Schwartz at the inquest into Liz Stride's case is that the name Lipsky, which he alleges was used by a man whom he saw assaulting the woman in Burner Street on the night of the murder, was not addressed to the supposed accomplice, but to Schwartz himself. So according to Anderson, Schwartz had given evidence at the inquest. On the 6th of November, Sir Charles Warren, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, repeated Anderson's assertion almost word for word in a letter that he sent to the Home Office in which he wrote, I have to acquaint you, for the information of the Secretary of State, that the opinion arrived at upon the evidence given by Schwartz at the inquest in Elizabeth Stride's case is that the name Lipsky, which he alleges was used by the man whom he saw assaulting the woman in Berners Street on the night of the murder, was not addressed to the supposed accomplice, but to Schwartz himself. It is clear that the higher echelons of the Metropolitan Police certainly believed that Schwartz had given evidence at the inquest into Elizabeth Stride's death, and it is therefore apparent that the police considered Schwartz an important witness as late as November 1888, a full month after he had walked into Lehman Street Police Station to report what he had seen. So, did Israel Schwartz actually give his inquest evidence in camera behind closed doors, possibly at the request of the police, and possibly to protect him from any repercussions from the murderer, and is that why his name is conspicuous by its absence in the extensive press coverage of the inquest? If he did, why would the police want to keep him secret? 
the honest answer to that question has to be, we simply do not know. However, in his memoirs, The Lighter Side of My Official Life, Sir Robert Anderson, as the by then retired former assistant commissioner had become, made the tantalising claim that Jack the Ripper's identity had in fact been established. He wrote, Having regard to the interest attaching to this case, I am almost tempted to disclose the identity of the murderer, but no public benefit would result from such a course. I will merely add that the only person who had ever had a good view of the murderer unhesitatingly identified the suspect the instant he was confronted with him, but he refused to give evidence against him. Is it possible that Anderson's mystery witness was none other than Israel Schwartz? After all, if Schwartz did, as his statement suggests, see the early stages of the murder of Elizabeth Stride, he most certainly did get a good view of the murderer. And, according to notes made by Chief Inspector Donald Swanson in his copy of Anderson's book, the reason the witness refused to give evidence against their suspect was because the suspect was, like the witness, also a Jew, a description that would fit Schwartz, who, according to Abilene's 5th of November report, had a strong Jewish appearance. Could it be that the police wished to keep Schwartz out of the public spotlight in the event that they would need him to identify the murderer were they to catch him, so his inquest testimony was given in camera behind closed doors? Were journalists therefore thrown off the trail of this important witness by the simple ruse of telling the Star and other newspapers that they had reason to doubt the truth of his story? Sadly, all this reading between the lines must remain nothing more than idle speculation. Israel Schwartz is just another tantalising aspect of the case that cropped up, added yet another element of mystery to the saga, and then faded into obscurity, leaving us today none the wiser as to what actually happened in Berner Street in the early hours of the 30th of September, 1888.